I didn't go to Iraq to win hearts and minds. I went there to kill them, the, the bad guys. I went to terrorize the terrorists. I consider myself terrorist, terrorizer, because I believe this is the most effective way to wage the war on terror. You can't negotiate with, uh, with murderers and bandits. You just have to eliminate them. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was born in the 1960s behind Iron Curtain in communist Poland. And this is uh, the time that we all know how dangerous these communist system, systems were in Eastern Europe. So uh, political prisoners, political murders, assassinations, censorship, uh, that was norm. The, the fraudulent elections, that was norm. Intimidation by the state, intimidation of political opponents, intimidation of their families and their friends. And yes, I encountered that too, and eventually I was forced to leave Poland in 1980s after spending time in communist prison as a political prisoner. What did you do that got you arrested, or what did they accuse you of doing that got you imprisoned? What happened is in 1981, in December 1980, there was the communist system was crumbling. The economy was in shambles. They decided to impose martial law. So on December 13, at midnight, they arrested, they already had a list of uh, political opponents prepared like a year or years ahead. So that December 13, they arrested around 25, there are different estimates from, from 25 to 60,000 people. So basically secret police, military, and police, uniform police were raiding citizens' homes and arresting them, pulling them out. Sometimes the children were left in the house, in the apartments, with no supervision because the parents were detained, arrested. So that's where this, I start to get engaged even more uh, in the opposition. This, this is where me and friend of mine, friends of mine, st were uh, printing underground, we call it underground, it was just bulletin. And we call it newspaper, but it was basically a leaflet with two pages, just telling people what is really going on, collecting information, who is getting arrested, and uh, they try to disseminate to people so people know what is, uh, what's happening. And the information is the most dangerous thing to totalitarian socialist system. So we were very promptly, I think, tracked down and arrested. That's how I ended up with a three years, three years prison sentence and sent to the harshest Polish prison at the time to Hrubieszow, a very infamous prison where I, uh, yeah, where I spent my time as a political prisoner. Now you came to America in 1984, you mm -hmm. said. Five years later, you see the Iron Curtain come down. Yes, from, never expected. Uh, from, from a distance. What was that moment like when you saw that Poland well, was at, free? at this time, uh, I, in 1991, I became U.S. citizen. This is, I think, the greatest moment in my life. And yeah, when I was watching uh, the, 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 the Iron Curtain found, uh, crumbling, when I was watching the communists being kicked out of the governments, that was like a pretty, uh, it was a relief for me because I know that these systems will never threaten free people, will never threaten America again. So that was like a good feeling. All right, so let's move to 1991. You said <coughs> the best moment of your life, you became an American citizen. Yes, I, be I became an American citizen. And this is something that is, uh, again, there's like moments in my life that sometimes bring tears to my eyes. So I became American citizens, but also at the time, America was fighting a war, a first Persian war. So I, that was my moral obligation to support my country, my America, the best I can. And for me, the, the most effective way to do so was to join military. So I decided to pick a rifle and fight the war on behalf of America and my America, my American on behalf of my fellow American citizens. This is how my adventure, I would say, uh, with military started. Though my, never, my intention was never to stay in military 
20 years like I did. And for me, my first idea was America is fighting war. I want to be one, one of them, one of the military personnel supporting America and fighting that war on behalf of America. But after the war, since by this time I had a really sad life, great life in America, my intention was to come back to my normal life and uh, well, it happened, I never did. I stayed in military for 20 years in the U.S. Navy. I'm very proud of it. And we're very grateful for it. Uh, when you joined the Navy, did you already know you wanted to become a SEAL? Well, I didn't know what the SEALs were. That's not what uh, Eventually, I learned that there is a unit called Navy SEALs, but my intention was to join military and uh, serve wherever America needs me. That was not my... Uh, intention just to go and be a Navy SEAL eventually, I, I, when I learned more about Navy SEALs, yes, I wanted to serve within Navy SEAL teams, and eventually I made it, I became Navy SEAL, and I fought the... When did you go to BUDS training? Uh, well, my class was 185 in 1993, I was already, 1992, I was already 32 years old, so I was four years over the age limit, but I'm so grateful to this nation that actually I was, that gave me the waiver, and I was able to actually attend the selection buds. Eventually, I became instructor there at the end of my career. American Veterans Center is proud to announce that this video is sponsored by Aura.com. Aura makes it their mission to provide an all-in-one intelligent safety solution that makes it simple to understand and easy to use. Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed on public listing sites? Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others that want to learn more about you, like even where you live. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. Let Aura handle this for you. Aura also does so much to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't see. You can either let these people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to Aura.com forward slash American Veterans Center to start your two week free trial. Also, that will be linked in the description below. Tell me what BUDS training was like as a, as a man who was older than the typical uh, BUDS trainee. So what did you expect it to be and what was it really like? Well, what I expected to be is a little bit different than the reality was. I expected to be, I was thinking at the time that since those are special forces, I would be locked up for an entire six months somewhere on base and I will be training, training, training. Well, I told myself I spent almost two years in communist prison, so that couldn't be that bad. Well, it turned out to be that uh, it is, the training is actually uh, training and selection, that you are not confined to base or to some kind of prison environment, that you are, uh, you are working during day and night time, whatever that do the training that needs to be done, but then you are free to go to your either apartment on town or go to your barracks. So uh, that was a big surprise for me. And, uh, but the, the other aspects were a little bit more difficult because I was older and uh, I, was, uh, I was in selection with people 18, 20, 21 years old. So no matter what BW you get by this, when you are that young, you just recover the next day and can good to go for me. It was a little bit more difficult. So when my uh, uh, friends, uh, call them teammates in BATS, uh, left party after the work day or on the weekend, I was recovering in bed with Ben Gay <laughs> all over my body, trying to survive the next day. So I think that was the big challenge for me. As far as the stress is concerned, it really didn't faze me. There was nothing there that uh, I just, uh, I, I expect to be very harsh. I expected very harsh treatment, so there was nothing surprised to me. Nothing phased me out. Phased me that uh, of this kind. So that was that was part of it was a little bit easier. Well, you said uh, 1993. You got your trident. Yes. Right? Okay. And what happened next? So I was assigned to uh, initially to CL Team Two, 
And at that time, the process of becoming a CR was a little bit different than this today. Today, you go to, uh, through the bad selection, then you go to uh, jump school, army jump school, go to SQT, and then you go, or vice versa, or, or the, in different order, but you, so it's uh, BATS, uh, SQT, jump school, and then you assign to CL team. When you graduate from SQT, CL qualification training, you have a tried and you are full-fledged CL uh, with a little experience, but you are considered a CL, you get 5326 NEC assigned to you, but at my time, that was a little bit different because you had to go, you were assigned to CL team two, you have to go to the, that time was STT, what they call it, the CL tactical training versus CL qualification training as today. After the CL tactical training, you were assigned to CL platoon on prob probationary uh, uh, period. And then they, after passing uh, the, the board in front of the chiefs, master chiefs and officers, you were uh, then, after successfully uh, passing that probationary period, you then you were assigned the seal insignia and the 5326 NEC. So uh, there's not only enough to finish, graduate all the courses, but you have to prove yourself in the seal team that yes, you are the man these people, these uh, uh, experienced seals want to work with and then you are assigned a SEAL team. That's how, that was my, my road to become a SEAL. How did your fellow SEAL team members accept you as an older SEAL? Was it just once you're a SEAL, you're a brother? Uh, well, once you're a SEAL, you're a brother. It just, you are a new guy, so you are not that quiet so brother yet. Well, it is, but your place in the SEAL platoon is not very... Uh, you are still a new seal. Everybody knows there is so much things to learn, and th that process is fairly long. So, until the first uh, deployment, when you deploy overseas with seal platoon, you are still a new guy, and they call you basically new guy FNG. Basically, I want to say the, that word here. I know but, what that means. Right. So that's that was my way. But eventually, you prove yourself, and uh, and, and then uh, yeah, you see, like. There is no difference. With in my case, because uh, my accent and my age, those was maybe a little bit odd. But I was always I, the, the, I always have the support of my fellow teammates. I was never treated differently. For them, uh, it was and uh, that's what we learn all in the U.S. Navy. We are all the same. We are just Americans. We have the same color: red, white, and blue. That's, that's all we need to be concerned. We look in our hearts, we don't look how you look outside. As you do your job right, you perform, you are a good seal. That's fantastic. Talk about the bond that forms when you spend all this time together. Well, this is something that is very unique. Uh, every community that is so tightly knitted will have this bond or similar bond. But with the seal teams, please remember that Every day, whether it's in combat or in training, we do something that can kill us. And that's created a very unique bond, especially within the SEAL teams. So we, we, are, we become like a brotherhood. We don't call each other, hey, Navy SEAL, and so we call each other, hey, brother. So th this is brotherhood. But we also realize that that, bro that brotherhood of Navy SEALs is encompassed by the bigger brotherhood, the brotherhood of our military, our veterans. And that brotherhood is encompassed with the greatest brotherhood, the American brotherhood, American citizens' brotherhood. So, That's fantastic. Where were you first deployed? This is the mid-90s, so we're not to 9-11 yet. So what kind of operations and locations were you? My, fir my first deployment was to uh, Bosnia, not to Bosnia, was to uh, Italy. It was at the time that uh, one of our pilots was shut down over Bosnia. So this is where one of our missions was to go and find him. And uh, not only our unit was looking and supporting the operation of recovering him, but uh, those, our, I think, entire military was trying to find and save this, uh, our pilot. So yes, I was, we were flying over Adriatic quite often and uh, waiting for, uh, for a call. 
that didn't happen. Actually, another unit was able to rescue our pilot. And, um, but I'm proud I participated in it. Oh, of course, of course. Where were you on 9-11 and what do you remember about that day? A very tragic day and I remember like today, I, I was in the SEAL team too, in the gym, we were working out and I remember one of our teammates uh, came in the gym say, hey, there's an airplane that hit the, one of the towers. And I was like, well, some inexperienced pilot in small airplane got lost and very tragic, but well, let's go back to work out. And then we hear there was a big, there was a big airplane, there was a jetliner. Uh, so at that time we stopped what we were doing. I think when all, we went to quarter deck, where was big TV, and we started watching it. And actually I seen the second plane hitting the tower. So we knew we'll, we'll deploy, we'll, we'll be used. We'll, we'll go after these bastards. How did that change your training? How did that change your mission as a SEAL team? And, and when did you find out where and when you were being deployed? Um, at that time, there was another coast deployed to war. When the war started, I was on the East Coast and um, we were actually deployed to South America and Central America. When the call came in for me specifically that I need to pack my stuff and go to Baghdad to help coordinate our uh, missions with Polish Special Forces that were grown that they were working with us in Baghdad. I was po I'm Polish speaker, I can speak Polish, Russian, and Japanese. So with uh, this, uh, I was tasked to help coordinate and facilitate uh, uh, Polish Special Forces Chrome with, uh, within the, our missions. And this is where we start working with them very closely and uh, to the point that we're doing missions together, the same missions. My primary job in SEAL teams was always a uh, breacher, so my expertise is our explosives. My expertise is uh, just being able to gain access to target, to, uh, to an object, to my SEAL platoon, my SEAL team. So that was my, my job. And so when it comes to breaching, you developed a method to reduce and limit casualties of non-combatants. So yes. I don't know how much detail you can give, but how is breaching generally done and how did you adjust it? So what, what happened in Iraq, uh, we were going after the hardened targets of people who are, the terrorists didn't have a problem hiding themselves behind children and women. So that initial explosion actually stuns them, allows us to enter it and eliminate the threats. And, but we also knew uh, that the women and children are on target. Most of the time, most of the targets that we hit were uh, with women and children uh, between, and the terrorists hiding behind them. So we didn't really have much option because the explosives that we used, the way that we used these explosives, they were, in this, that they were uh, indiscriminately uh, throwing the fragments and fragmentations of the door, wall, ceiling, or floor, and depends which way we are going inside, um, and could potentially injure uh, women and children. So I had to devise a, a method of entry that would not throw that many uh, uh, fragments inside, but also it allow us shorter standoff from the explosion, so quicker access to the target. I don't want to go into details how the charge worked and what the charge was. That's, that, that's irrelevant, but yes, I was very instrumental in developing also different tactics that will be, allow us to be more effective uh, 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 assaulting uh, targets with terrorists. What and if they happened. somehow knew you were coming? Did that ever happen? And how did you deal with that if they, had a, they were ready to defend themselves? Well, uh, like Spartans 2,000 years ago used to say, uh, you, fight, you wage the war for maybe three years. After three years, you are teaching your enemy. And of course, we've seen them too. We've seen them responding to our uh, actions and uh, trying to counteract it. They were never effective because we are extremely well trained and we are extremely effective. Uh, so they had no chance. But yes, we can see the countermeasure they try to take and, uh, and, uh, and, and try to... Uh, do harm to us, but didn't work. But please remember too that I didn't go to Iraq to win hearts and minds. I went there to kill them. 
the, the bad guys. I want to terrorize the terrorists. I consider myself terrorist, terrorizer, because I believe this is the most effective way to wage the war on terror. You can't negotiate with, with murderers and bandits. You just have to eliminate them. What did that involve besides what we've already talked about, the breaching and the, and the, and the taking into custody? Well, w w I would say we're inviting the terrorist, terrorists to prison. If they didn't listen, we just eliminated them. But if they were able to apprehend them, we prefer to apprehend them because uh, the information that we can gain eliminate more and more of these terrorists. So um, we, we tried to apprehend them, but we couldn't. We just eliminate them. Did they talk much when you had them in custody? Oh, the terrorists? Yes. Oh, yeah, they like to talk. They, 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 sell, they will sell their own mother, father, grandfather, anybody just to save their skin. Uh, but um, they, yeah, they were very talkative, although usually on target, they tend to pretend they don't speak English, no English, no English. So this is where I devised so-called Drago Accelerated English course for terrorists. You give me 10 minutes with a terrorist and through persuasion and very nice treatment, he will, I guarantee he will be speaking uh, English. Sometimes the effects were so, so amazing, they were speaking with better accent than I can say it. So <laughs> that's... Uh, Did your tactics become standard <clears throat> procedure? Not these tactics, uh, with being super nice to a terrorist and kind of convince him to speak English. Uh, that is just my things that I maybe will patent one day, but no, that, were not, that was my trade secret. Did anything surprise you about being at war? Not really, because everything that I've seen in the war, that, I mean, I might be a different way. I haven't seen anything in the war that Navy did not prepare me to see. I didn't do anything in the war that Navy did not prepare me to do. So it was like, well, old machine that you just, you, 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 yeah. Were there moments where you thought to yourself, that's why they had them, that's why they had us do this in training, so we could be ready for something like this? Yes, that, there were moments like this, too. It was like, almost like a revelation, okay, now I understand. Uh, <clears throat> but, um, but also, I remember when I left the war zone, when I became SEAL instructor, and uh, in, in that selection, in, in famous, famous or infamous, however, it depends how you look at it, uh, selection, I, I, I apply some of these lessons that I learned to make our uh, students better, to prepare them better for combat, to be, prepare them to be a better SEAL. So I'm very proud of it. How many deployments did you have in Iraq? I did uh, three deployments back to back, 2003, 2004, 2005. Well, 20 years uh, in the United States Navy, most of that time as a Navy SEAL, but now nearly 40 years living in America and more than 30 years as an American citizen. So what's your message um, about why you appreciate America and, and, and well, why the rest of us should too? And I will use this opportunity here to thank American people for my freedom. I never had the chance to do it on the bigger scale. So now I've, I would like to use it and say thank you for my freedom. But also there I would like to point something out. See, America was built on goodness, on personal freedom. It is so ingrained in American people that they just don't see it. It's so transparent to them. This is the way they are. They are just good people because they were brought up to be good people, good citizens. And they don't think much about it. But what I would ask is take a step back and look. At, for, when I look from outside, I see beautiful country run by beautiful, awesome people who, are cherish, who cherish their freedoms, cherish their America, cherish their country. Take, take a step back and look at America. Look how beautiful, unique, and special country it is. And this is my view of America. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a Navy SEAL. But you don't see me wearing this little trident here, like most of the people, our seals, many seals do, and righteously, so they deserved it. They earned that honor to wear the trident. But I wear only American flag because American flag encompasses everything that is good, encompasses the Navy Seal trident as well. And also when I, when, when, when 
I want people to see me not as a Navy SEAL. I want them to see me as American. There is no hyphen in front of this American. I'm just an American. I'm proud American. That was the proudest thing. That was my biggest achievement in my life.